<clears throat> Madam Rosana Costa, Governor of the Central Bank of Chile, Mr. Mario Marcel, Minister of Finance of the Government of Chile, Juan Gabriel Valdez, Ambassador of Chile to the United States, Mr. Alexei, Alexei uh, Raminov, Head of Debt Capital Markets for Latin America, HSBC, dear board, board members of INVEST, dear all, dear friends, First of all, of all, let me welcome you all. It is my great pleasure to open the plenary of 2022 Chile Day in New York City. I would like to especially thank our sponsors that make for Invest this possible. HSBC, Amundi, BCI, Compass Group, Credit, Top, Credit Cop Capital, DCB, Drake Enterprises, Moneda Asset Manage Management, Picton, Provida, Shredders, Southern Cross Group, and SQM. Today, we finally met after three years since we had our latest Chile Day in 2019. So many things have happened since then that it seems like ages. But here we are once again displaying that Chile, that Chile Day, sorry, is an indication that genuine public-private collaboration is possible. It has been done for almost 15 years and during five different governments with a single goal, showing the international community the robustness of our financial markets and looking for new opportunities for Chile's development. Beside all the changes that we as a nation are going through, Chile has always chosen to mobilize besides, behind certain goals. This is one of our main characteristics a reflection of who we are. As, this, as the Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega Gasset once says, when he visited Chile in 1928, and of course, an, er an earthquake happened, he said, Chile is like Sisyphus. He li lives in the mountain ranges and seems to be condemned to watch his accomplishments falls a one times, and it's so true. And this is why here we are again behind the same beautiful goal of developing our nation through the development of our financial markets. While in the last 40 years, the pension system increased the national long-term private savings, allowing the expansion of a long-term fixed income capital markets, a sophisticated banking system, an industry of asset management, etc., that finance all new kind of infrastructure, provided a long-term and low-cost mortgage market, and at last broke what Velasco and Calvo called the Latin American original sins. Since 2019, we have witnessed how the implementation of short-sighted and populist public policies have damaged the deepness, liquidity, and development of our capital markets. We have done several mistakes. This has had important macroeconomic effects. Less national savings, more volatile local financial markets, an important deficit in our current account, and so on. But more importantly, it has also had impact over millions of Chileans by reducing their possibilities to buy a house, start their own businesses, or just have the tranquility of knowing that their income and service savings will not lose value through inflation. But we shouldn't stay on the past. We have seen that, for instance, both fiscal and monetary policies have early reacted. That is, is why all of us who play a role in the design and development of our financial markets have the responsibility to amend the course and use the huge advantages that Chile has as an institutional level in competitiveness and opportunities in areas such as green hydrogen, renewable energies, the knowledge economy, fintech, innovation, services, etc., in order to increase the well-being of our nation. This requires common efforts in at least three dimensions. First, discipline, to keep the technical diagnosis clear, to face 
the populist siren calls. Secondly, empathy and solidarity, especially for the private sector, to confront in the short run the still huge unsatisfied social demands and inequalities. And thirdly, political courage to defend the proper public policies that will allow us to relate in a genuine condition of liberty and equality. For instance, as we enter into a deep discussion whether the kind of pension system that Chile will require, we will think about its impact on the financial system development. Also, if we're going to be free to choose who will manage our savings, or if the playing field is going to be equal and open to all participants. These are questions that not only are not only a matter that has to do with the effect on the macroeconomic development or the finance of long-term long -term investment. More importantly, these are questions that have to do with the kind of relationship and institutional framework that the, we want to build for our future. Thus, it will be crucial to defend the true concept of open and competitive markets, the rule of law, the non-discriminatory treatment between agents, to think truly how we should do things differently to open new opportunities, for instance, to small and medium enterprises, to venture capital, but most importantly, to reinforce the idea that the collective life supports on the capacity of dialogue and the participation of all who are part of the collective life of our nation. And that is exactly what Chile Day is all about, a path to build relationships based on trust and good faith, to find a path and a way to make things differently and to leave no one behind. So welcome and please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, my name is Alexi Remezov, and as Pablo mentioned, I head capital market, dead capital markets business for HSBC uh, for Latin America based in New York. And again, welcome everyone on behalf of the sponsors to this uh, Chile Day in New York 2022 event. Um, as always, it's an honor and a pleasure for HSBC to host such a, an important event for the Republic of, of Chile. It's very prestigious and it has been for many years. Um, we would like to uh, thank the Chilean Ministry of Finance and INVEST for again offering this opportunity to, to host such an important event. Um, we're pleased here to be in the company of um, Mario Marcel, who is um, with us today. We had a pleasure to welcome him for, for many years as the governor of Central Bank of Chile at the Chile days in the past. And, and again, we're so happy that, uh, to welcome him in his new capacity as the Finance Minister of Chile uh, today. I also would like to acknowledge um, the Governor of Central Bank of Chile, Rosana Costa, who is also with us here, um, and uh, the, um, the Ambassador of Chile in the United States, Juan Gabriel uh, Valdez. Yeah, he is also with us today. Yeah, welcome. Um, it would be... Um, Obviously, Chile is an important part of HSBC's um, global franchise. We, um, you know, we, we run a, a bank in over 60 countries in the world, and Chile has been an integral part, part of our business. And I think we've managed um, a lot of important financing transactions for the government of Chile and a number of Chilean entities for years. And of particular importance have been transactions in ESG space in, in the most recent years. The, um, Global economic backdrop is uncertain and challenging. As you probably know, inflation is a key concern, exacerbated by a number of uh, significant supply shocks in, in many areas of, of global economy. And that's been prompting, prompting monetary tightening across the globe. And of course, as a result, we're seeing significant risk of economic deceleration around the world and potentially um, a drop in, you know, to, towards a recession. 
And of course, in this context, um, this is a unique opportunity. I mean, Chile obviously is part of the global economy. It's an open economy, as, as we all know. And therefore, as, 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 as such, it, it is exposed to, to global shocks. And it's definitely the right you know, venue for us uh, to be at here at the Chile Day to discuss how the uh, current, this new administration um, is countering some of these adverse, um, uh, ad adverse events. And I think, as what, what also Pablo mentioned, how this new administration will be addressing the challenge of, of broadening the, the access of the population, returning the access of, of the Chilean population to economic opportunities. So the growth in Chile is, 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 is put back on a more sustainable path. So it's, I think, very important. Um, the tradition of transparency, openness, and dialogue um, is a hallmark of the Chilean society. And, and we feel in this spirit, um, its support, its status, as one of the most stable, advanced, and investor-friendly economies in Latin America. And we also feel that this spirit of transparency will allow us to have two very productive days of panels and in very open discussions uh, to reflect on the topics that I outlined. Um, on that note, uh, I'm going to turn back to Pablo, to Pablo, who will introduce our next speak, uh, speaker, the governor of the Central Bank, Rosanna Costin. Please. Thank you, Alexei. So um, our next speaker uh, is Rosanna Costa. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce her. Rosanna Costa has a bachelor degree uh, in business administration and economics from the uh, Pontificia, Pont I will say it in Spanish, the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Um, she was appointed as board member of the Central Bank uh, in 2017 and uh, governor of the Central Bank in 2022. So thank you so much, uh, Madam President, Governor, for being here in New York with us. Thank you, Pablo. Thanks also to INVEST. Good afternoon to all of you, Minister, Ambassador. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, to talk all of you today about the current economic development and challenges of my country, Chile. In this talk today, I will start by briefly reviewing how the COVID talking hit Chile, what was the policy response, and what did they achieve. This will not only include the monetary policy reaction, but also fiscal policy and other measures implemented during the crisis. I will then continue to describe the strong and positive reaction of the economy to this policy package and discuss its unintended consequences, including the important increase in inflation and its evolution. I will conclude by reviewing the challenges I see today and I see for the future, uh, for the near future. I will not stop slide by slide because I'm not one to, to, be, to have a so long presentation, but uh, it, will be, it will help you to clear what we are going to, to we, I am going to say. COVID talk, as we all painfully know, took the world by surprise in March 2020. The pandemic, which started as an unknown disease in China, quickly took hold around the globe causing governments to undertake unprecedented measures, imposing restrictions to limit the spread of the virus. Chile was no exception. The COVID-19 found our economy not so quickly. It's moving alone. <laughs> it's magic. Um, Till was no the exception. The COVID-19 found our economy emerging from uh, the October 2019 episodes of social unrest that had culminated in a political agreement to change the constitution. The government reacted swiftly. Non-essential businesses were not allowed to operate face-to-face, -face. lockdowns were imposed, and many workers were sent home to telework. These measures 
though necessary to control infection, brought economic activity to a halt which felt 15% in annual terms in April of 2020. Services sectors were among the most affected with months on months economic downturns of about 25%, as you can see left in the figure of the slide. Many firms ceased activity and employment plummet. Around 1 million people ceased to work only during April, which is more than 10% of the total employee. You can see that on the right side of the slide. Many firms ceased activity and employment plummet, as I said, and the reason behind this change was either because they were permanently and temporarily laid off or because they had to quit labor force to care of family members. This latter case was especially strong among women and old workers. Due to the severity of the crisis that was breeding, a battery of policy measures was swiftly implemented, making use of the ample fiscal and monetary policy space available thanks to previous fiscal discipline and hard one monetary credibility. The first line of action was a strong was through monetary policy. The monetary policy rate was lowered by 25 basis point to a level of 1% on mid-March of 2020. On the next scheduled meeting at the end of March, the monetary policy rate was lowered to 0.5%, the effective lower bond rate uh, for Chile. At the same time, the central bank implemented additional measures to incentivize credit and provide liquidity. During March of the, of the year, we announced a liquidity facility for commercial banks consisting of a collateralized fixed credit line of up to 3% of the commercial and retail portfolios and a variable credit line conditional on the increase in loans called thick by its initials in Spanish. As the pandemic continued, the central bank extended this program twice, lending in total $37 billion to commercial banks, or about 15% of the GDP. Several fiscal or quasi-fiscal policies were also applied. Ones that directly affected firms were two government credit guarantee programs to small and medium-sized firms called FOGAPE and an employment protection program. The latter allowed firms to freeze labor contracts for 10 months while employees could withdraw funds from their unemployment insurance account. Several direct cash transfers by government and three pension fund withdrawals that took place in July 2020, December 2020, and April 2021 were among the policies that directly benefited households. Many of these measures happened at the same time, so it is difficult to attribute the economy's response to one policy in particular. However, a study conducted by economists at the central bank shows that the credit guarantee program and the employment protection program were, were highly successful in providing liquidity and relief to ailing firms. There was widespread access and excellent coverage in the credit guarantee program. Close to 40% of all firms computed with respect to the number of firms with positive sales each month around 250,000 obtain a FOGAPE credit at some point during the crisis. Credit was allocated mostly to small firms that had experienced significant decreases in sales. Firms that accessed FOGAPE recovered faster than those that did not. Two out of every three firms that ceased to report sales re-entered the market, with the medium length of exit being about five months. That appear at the top right in the panel. 
Likewise, the Employee Protection Program had widespread coverage. Nearly 45% of firms with at least one employee accessed the program, mostly from micro and small firms. Among firms that did access, close to 80% of payroll was enrolled in the program by mid-2020, and their sales dropped substantially. The recovery of sales to pre-pandemic levels has been steady but slow. Micro evidence shows that firms that accessed the Employment Protection Program had much better performance in the months following access to the program than similar firms that did not access to it. Without the combined effect of all policies implemented, output in 2020 would have fallen about four to seven percent more, as is shown left table on slide. Even though all policies had important positive contribution to avoid a further deterioration in output, credit policies were the most important ones. Liquidity provision, credit guarantees, and regulatory flexibility allowed credit to firms to react in a counter-cyclical fashion for the first time in the history of economic recessions in my country. As you can see that right hand in the figure. During a 2021, fiscal policies and pension fund withdrawals became more important. The fiscal effort in Chile in terms of additional spending and foregone revenue was particularly important amounting to almost 13% of GDP. This is almost the highest of emerging economies and well above the average of advanced economies. And you can see how in the blue part appears the income lost by household and in the upper side, the income provided by these programs. All in all, household liquidity was increased significantly. The sum of the different sources of household liquidity regular income plus the resources provided by the state and pension fund withdrawals yield cumulative resources of close to $71 billion between 2020 and 2021, equivalent to 28% of GDP. Appears in the right figures. So, we are going to begin with the recovery and what happened with inflation and monetary policy. While the policies implemented were very effective in dampening the economic downturn due to COVID-19, they also brought some unintended less favorable consequences, uh, which are important to study. One such consequence was an important and persistent reduction in labor force participation. The drop in the labor force was a worldwide phenomenon, but was particularly large in, Lat in LATAM and in Chile. While most countries have seen important recoveries in their labor participation levels, current numbers show that Chile is still lacking, as you can see in the figure. To understand the delay in the recovery of the labor force, a study conducted at the Central Bank of Chile found that the recovery in the labor force is positively associated with the recovery in employment levels, except in our country, where there is a decoupling between those two measures. The study goes further and econometrically suggests that the heterogeneity in the labor force recovery across countries can be explained mainly by differences in fiscal support, in programs to keep jobs, and to a lesser extent, in the recovery of the economy. Another unintended consequence that not only occurred in Chile was that inflation accelerated, reaching levels well above the central bank target. Part of this inflation has been explained by increases in commodity price and in some specific goods, especially the ones for which supply chain disruptions 
were most prevalent. A study of firms margins shown in our last monetary policy report in June 2022 delved into some of the factors behind the elevated inflation. We found that margins are significantly tight, which typically occurs as a response to big demand increases, suggesting that prices still need to rise because, of, because if margin determinants have not changed, a process of margin normalization should ensue. The inflationary process in Chile started earlier than in most countries. During the first half of 2021, it was clear that inflation was rising because of local shocks and policies that boosted demand like universal fiscal transfer and pension fund withdrawals. This, can, this was the case for some other countries like the US, where local factors were also at play as inflation picked up by the end of 2021. You can see that in the figure at the left. One uh, possible global factor is the, opening, is the opening of the economies that happened around the same time for most countries. Over this period, uh, Chilean inflation was mostly driven by foods and core goods and services consistent with the high dynamism of consumption and normal prices adjustment. As the high dynamism of consumption supported the inflationary process, the Central Bank of Chile started its monetary policy tightening cycle early on in July 2021. The tightening cycle started before most emerging and advanced economies, as you can see in the slide. The local inflationary process was reinforced by the end of 2021 by factors that were affecting economies globally. Supply side bottlenecks left as an aftermath of the pandemic and the effect of the Russian invasion on, of Ukraine in energy and commodity, commodity prices compounding to the local economy and hit Chile in an already high inflation environment. As in many other economies around the world, inflation has surprised over the past months. These surprises have, have been driven mostly by volatiles and foods. Another important fraction of the surprises has, has come from energy prices. In contrast, core services inflation has shown bounded surprises and core goods have been in line with projections. Uh, it is important to point out that even though external factors have been the most important factors supporting the latest inflation surprises, most of the current inflation figures is still explained mostly by local factors. From now, from now on and in the future, we expect a relatively lower impulse from local factors, since expectation of firms and household show important deterioration. External factors are usually considered as transitory shocks, and its persistence usually fades within Chile's monetary policy time framework. In today's scenario, due to both the inflation level that adds some persistency to the inflation dynamics and the nature of the shocks, the effect is more prolonged. From a monetary policy standpoint, it is important then to distinguish each shock nature to assess the impact on expected inflation within the central bank time frame. When they are persistent, as they are now, constitute an additional source of domestic inflation magnification because of the second round effect on domestic prices and add persistence to the inflationary process. For this reason, it is important that monetary policy react accordingly. After years of living in a one-digit inflation environment, inflation soared, and so did the concern of household and firms about its future past. 
According to a study conducted in September 2021 by a market and public opinion research firm, CADEM, and corroborated by surveys conducted by the central bank this last March, households feel that the increase in prices is the main problem currently faced by the country. Inflation expectations are very important because they directly affect decisions made by agents and with that, inflation persistence. Because the main decision makers are firms and households, the central bank has made efforts to monitor expectations beyond those of professional forecasters and include firms and households' uh, expectations. The central bank has started to conduct a new price determinant service on firms called Encuesta de Determinantes de Precios, EDEP by its initial in Spanish. To inquire about not only inflation expectation, but also determinants of individual price change for firms, and is planning on conducting household expectation surveys soon. You can see the, in the figures the numbers we are looking now. All the measures monitored by the central bank for inflation expectation one and two years ahead have shown important increases. This is a great concern for the central bank. It is, it is being monitored very closely and has also contributed to the speed of the monetary policy rate hikes. Lately, there have been some signs, some things that, although one year ahead expectation continue to rise in reaction to economic news, two year ahead expectation of professional forecasters are more stable. Given the increases in inflation around the globe, most central banks have started to raise their policy rate to stop inflationary pressures, but their velocity and intensity varies considerably across countries. In many emerging economies, particularly in Latin America, the races started in mid-2021 and had advanced rapidly, reaching rates above or around their own estimated neutral rates. In developed, in developed countries, the pace of increase has been slower and less intense. Central banks of commodity exporting countries have tended to respond faster than the US Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank. In these two economies, short-term real rates are still negative and significantly below their neutral rate estimates, as you can see. At the Central Bank of Chile, inflation is our main concern. We have the tools and the determination to react to the many inflationary pressures that the Chilean economy faces and will ensure to restore inflation back to its 3% target in a two-year time horizon. Over the last months, as the Fed signaled a more aggressive tightening cycle, the financial markets have been highly volatile and fears of a global recession have sparked. These conditions are particularly challenging for emerging countries like Chile as the strengthening of the US dollar, tighter financial condition, and lower copper prices are headwinds to growth. Given this backdrop, uh, local currency fundamentals have continued to de deteriorate in a local context where volat volatility remains high, the Chilean peso has depreciated further. Over the last few days, this depreciation had shown unusual intensity and volatility which had stressed price formation in the currency market. The persistence of this scenario increased the probability of significant distortion to the financial markets functioning. For this reason, the board at the Central Bank of Chile, with the objective of easing the adjustment of the Chilean economy to the uncertain and changing local and external condition, has decided to implement a program of currency intervention and a preventive US dollar liquidity provision for an amount of up to $25 billion between this day and the end of September. In the short run, 
This development will cause further increase, increases in local prices in a context where inflation and its persistence are already high. The board estimates that new increases in the monetary policy rate will be necessary to ensure the convergence of inflation to 3% in two years. The magnitude of said increases will hint on the implications of the evolution of the scenario for the achievement of the inflation target. Pass to future challenges. Let me close this presentation by listing some challenges we are facing today in economic area. The first and foremost for the central bank is to return to inflation to the, its target. We at the central bank understand the hardships that high inflation imposes to Chileans, particularly to lower income families and are committed to taking all available measures to ensure that inflation converges to its target. The good news is that the prompt monetary policy response over the last year has facilitated the economic adjustment to a more balanced economy. This healthier starting point will be crucial to overcome the external scenario on the coming years. Second challenge is the replenishment of the hard earned buffers used to confront the pandemic. As a result of the stimulus policies to overcome the COVID crisis, government debt has increased to about 36% of GDP at the end of 2021, while the effective fiscal deficit was 8%. According to forecast from the budget office, the effective fiscal deficit should cover it to minus 1% of GDP in 2025, which could put government debt to reach 44% of GDP. The events in the recent past have shown that adequate level of fiscal deficit and debt provides space to conduct much needed counter-cyclical policies when a crisis hits. Preserving this space is paramount. This year's fiscal budget and the government fiscal medium term guidelines clearly move in that direction. A third challenge is the need to deepen Chile's financial market. A developed, sound, and deep financial market has been a cornerstone of resilience for the Chilean economy to external shocks, and it has provided the foundation for investment and economic growth. Pension funds with growers significantly reduced the volume of resources available at the local financial market. The pension fund asset decreased from representing 84 of GDP at the end of 2020 to 59% in 2022, like you can see in the right figures. Long-term and stable saving pools provide a cushion to absorb shocks and provide funding to long-term investment. Regaining financial debts is of utmost importance. From a broader point of view, a fourth challenge is to increase the growth of total factor productivity. This growth has been steadily decreasing in Chile. The latest forecast of total factor productivity growth published in the Monetary Policy Report of June 2021 is 0.35% yearly for the period between 2021 and 2030. The recent evolution of productivity is uncertain. Less investment and supply chain disruption due to COVID and geopolitical unrest tend to drive productivity down, but automation related to COVID-19 drives productivity up. We are revising this forecast and will publish it in one of the coming monetary policy reports. In any case, low productivity growth is a source of concern as it is an important ingredient of economic growth, and we should make effort to better understand it, and if possible, foster it. Finally, recovering labor force part participation is another challenge. As I already mentioned, the labor force 
was very badly hit by COVID-19 crisis, and it has recovered slower than economic activity, especially among women. As schools and daycare centers have opened and fiscal transfer are ending, over the past few months, there have been an increase in participation, but it is still below pre-pandemic levels for both men and women. This is a source of loss of human capital and worsened economic condition may make re-entry to the labor force hard. In sum, the Chilean economy has suffered several unprecedented shocks in the past few years. The social unrest, the COVID-19, um, the effect of the Ukrainian war, global supply chain disruption, and monetary policy tightening in advanced economies. Because we had fiscal and monetary policy space to face them, policies response have also been unprecedented and to a large extent highly successful. Despite this, we did not live completely unscathed, and a few wounds need tending in order to prevent permanent scars. Returning buffers to its pre-pandemic levels will allow to that our solid institutional framework to face the next crisis successfully minimizing the cost for our people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Governor Costa. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Marcel. Mr. Marcel is an economist for uh, Universidad de Chile. I like to say it in Spanish again. And a master in philosophy and economics from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. In 2015, he became board member of the Central Bank of Chile. And in 2016, he was appointed president of that institution, a position he held until the end of January of 2022. Two. And in March of the year of this year, um, he was appointed as Minister of Finance of the Government of Chile. And I will stop there because his curriculum is very long. <laughs> and Mr. Marcel, thank you so, so much for joining us uh, today. Um, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. All right, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to INVEST for organizing uh, this uh, uh, two-day event and inviting us uh, to share our views on the Chilean economy. Uh, I'm uh, glad uh, to join uh, Madame Costa, governor of the Central Bank, and uh, also the uh, Chilean ambassador to the US. Uh, I would also uh, like to acknowledge uh, HSBC sponsorship of uh, this uh, today event. Um, uh, what uh, I would like uh, to um, to emphasize in this uh, in this presentation is that uh, uh, Chile, of course, is a country that is uh, facing a number of challenges, like uh, many others. But uh, in our case, uh, we are undergoing uh, a broad uh, transition in at least uh, three overlapping uh, dimensions. Um, we are undergoing a transition on the productive, uh, uh, on the productive dimension, uh, moving from uh, being a, a mining oil dependent uh, economy uh, into a green growth uh, supplier and service hub, something that uh, perhaps a few years ago was uh, very uh, difficult to figure out. Um, uh, secondly, we are undergoing a political transition from a hierarchical centralized society into an inclusive society with a more institutionalized distributed power. And uh, of course, like everyone else, we are also undergoing an economic transition 
uh, from the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, and uh, it is in, in our case it's uh, disproportionate policy responses into uh, a more normalized economy that uh, still uh, still to be achieved. Um, these uh, features may be uh, present in a number of countries, but what uh, make them different in the case of Chile is that they became uh, particularly good due to the fast growth in the Chilean middle class, enhanced transparency and stagnating productivity. That uh, meant that we had a, a greater, we had to face greater demands from uh, the population with a capacity to grow that uh, was, uh, was uh, lower over time and uh, this, uh, to, um, uh, this is uh, part of what explains the uh, uh, social uh, crisis of 2019. Of course, there are a number of other dimensions to that, but uh, at least from the economic, uh, an economic point of view, that uh, those are uh, salient uh, issues. Uh, now, in uh, facing these, uh, these uh, challenges, um, a large ma majority of the population, even, even today, three years after, is uh, aiming uh, for a change. Uh, this is reflected in the attitudes uh, towards the constitutional referendum that we will hold in, in a, a month and a half from now, uh, where, as uh, we may discuss uh, later, uh, the largest uh, majority in uh, opinion polls is that uh, comprised of uh, people that uh, think that, uh, that they may want to reject the proposed constitution uh, to uh, uh, start a, a new a reform process and not going back uh, to the current constitution and those that uh, would like to approve and introduce further uh, changes into the text that was uh, that was proposed by the constitutional body so uh, those uh, groups together add up to 70 percent of the chilean people uh, which means that uh, we will continue facing demands for change and it will be very important to deliver on that uh, now, uh, delivering on that doesn't mean that we will stop being an open market-based economy, uh, but uh, rather that our future development will depend a lot on our ability to tackle uh, these uh, transitions and to complete them successfully. And uh, from that uh, perspective, the role of economic policy should be not to block uh, change, but rather to enable it and to ensure that it is uh, done in an effective and sustainable uh, way uh, so that uh, um, uh, we should uh, be uh, 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 concerned about uh, improving the functioning of markets, securing economic uh, stability, and uh, 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 guaranteeing fiscal discipline or uh, <coughs> fiscal responsibility in managing uh, uh, government uh, resources. So we will go uh, very fast uh, through the macro uh, developments and outlook, and then move into uh, longer term reforms that are currently being discussed. So on the macro uh, outlook, uh, it, is, uh, it is evident that we are facing a global environment that is uh, considerably uh, less uh, positive than we uh, faced in the past, uh, particularly in the financial markets. Uh, we have this uh, uh, pressure uh, coming from inflation, uh, monetary policy adjusting up, and uh, as, a, as a result of that, as a part of that, um, uh, currently uh, growth forecasts are all being adjusted down. Uh, here we have both uh, the IMF and OECD uh, forecasts. We are about to uh, learn the new, I mean, the update uh, uh, IMF outlook in the next uh, few days, but I'm sure that it will not change this a lot. Probably we'll have a, a, a bleaker uh, outlook for 2023. Uh, but uh, uh, this uh, year, of course, it's uh, pretty disappointing in terms of uh, growth, especially after the crisis that we underwent uh, uh, in uh, 2020. And uh, uh, part of that is explained by inflation becoming a global phenomenon. Uh, here we have the evolution of uh, CPIs in uh, advanced economies and emerging market and developing economies where both are converging up at uh, figures that uh, are on, for a large uh, uh, group of uh, countries averaging between 8 and 10 percent. Of course, we will have a distribution around that, but uh, uh, as we can see in the middle uh, chart, uh, the number of countries that are uh, facing inflation above their policy target is uh, growing uh, quite uh, significantly, reaching near, uh, near nearly 100 uh, countries, uh, uh, nearly 100 advanced economies, 
or 100% of advanced economies with uh, actual inflation exceeding uh, the inflation targets. Uh, uh, that uh, has uh, uh, forced the forecasters to move up inflation forecasts, both for 2022 and 2023, for the world as a whole, for advanced economies, for Latin America and the Caribbean as well. And uh, that is prompting uh, poly monetary policy responses uh, that, uh, that, of course, may vary across countries on when they, that, uh, the, the withdrawal of, uh, of uh, um, uh, monetary policy expansion started. But uh, it is uh, clearly everyone is moving more or less in the same direction. And as we can see in the left-hand side the chart, Chile is one of the countries that has adjusted up its uh, policy rate the faster and the uh, largest uh, compared to other countries. Uh, in the case of the US, uh, you, we can see moving from the green line to, um, to the, uh, uh, um, to the uh, blue line, how uh, the uh, expectation on federal funds rates has evolved. And then on the right-hand uh, side of the chart, how different countries are moving up with uh, emerging countries uh, starting their adjustment, uh, their cons their adjustment process uh, considerably earlier. Uh, the, uh, uh, um, the Russian invasion of, uh, of the Ukraine added to this by uh, putting pressure on commodity prices, particularly uh, food and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, fuels. Uh, but uh, in the last uh, few weeks, that has uh, reverted in the case of uh, a food like uh, wheat, almost a, a whole reversal on uh, the expansion that uh, on the upward pressure that we had uh, with the start of the conflict in the Ukraine. And uh, similarly, but not at the same scale, with uh, fuels and uh, oil in particular. And uh, this uh, downward pressure on uh, um, commodities has uh, reached uh, copper as well where uh, we see that uh, copper prices have uh, uh, gone down uh, by, uh, some, uh, by some 15 percent in a matter of only a few days. Uh, that doesn't mean that those uh, downward pressures will remain forever. Uh, there are more structural uh, factors that will uh, put, uh, uh, that will, will tend to move up uh, the price of copper, but for the time being, uh, we are seeing a major uh, change compared to the prices uh, that we uh, saw in the last uh, uh, few, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, in this uh, context, financial conditions have deteriorated sharply, with uh, stock exchanges moving down, uh, all currencies uh, de uh, devaluating against the U.S. dollar, and uh, uh, yields on on uh, uh, ten-year bonds uh, going up as well. And in this uh, comparison, uh, Chile comes a little in the middle of, uh, of this uh, distribution, uh, uh, or even in the, in the brighter side of that, because uh, our stock exchange didn't deteriorate as much as in other countries. Um, our uh, long-term rates also held uh, uh, pretty well up until uh, the beginning of uh, last week. And the exchange rate, of course, has become uh, a, a different issue with a, a strong uh, devaluation of the Chilean peso uh, uh, over the last uh, month uh, or so. But uh, before going to that, uh, uh, you know, in, in balance, um, with, uh, within this uh, broader framework, the Chilean economy, as, uh, as uh, 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 the governor of the central bank uh, just uh, showed, recovered from the COVID-19 crisis uh, faster than in any prior, uh, uh, in any prior um, uh, output contraction, uh, and that uh, was uh, uh, due mostly to the expansionary pressure of uh, uh, fiscal policy uh, by, um, uh, by the uh, counter-cyclical behavior of uh, lending, which was uh, quite uh, uh, unusual for uh, uh, business cycles in Chile, and also by uh, pension fund withdrawals. But the impact of that was so huge on uh, demand that uh, uh, it did not only put uh, pressure on uh, inflation, but also uh, moved uh, our current account balance uh, to a large uh, deficit, uh, nearly 7% uh, last year, 7% of GDP last year, 
uh, with uh, savings and investment moving in, uh, over, uh, in opposite uh, directions. This was uh, uh, joined by a large uh, government uh, deficit of uh, more than 7% in uh, 2021, following uh, uh, also some 7% in 2020. So in two years, we accumulated uh, our, a lot of fiscal disequ disequilibria, but particularly in 2021, we were uh, one of the countries, possibly the one with the most uh, expansionary uh, fiscal policy, pretty much a, a, a pro-cyclical uh, fiscal policy that uh, combined with um, the current account deficit to generate a twin deficit uh, scenario that is uh, partly uh, responsible for uh, what uh, we are witnessing today. Uh, inflation is now up to 12.5%. Uh, uh, core inflation is uh, uh, reaching 10%. Uh, 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 of course, uh, given that part of this is uh, due to um, commodity prices, also volatile prices uh, are, uh, 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 have increased even faster than uh, uh, headline inflation. So in this chart, we have the four uh, uh, drivers of inflation. Um, uh, first, uh, we see uh, the, uh, the bottlenecks that uh, emerged from the, um, that were created at the exit of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, then in Chile, we had a private uh, consumption growing extremely fast, uh, especially during 2021, uh, with the consumption on durable goods at some point uh, uh, getting to a point of 50% of above a pre-crisis level. So it was not only reversing uh, the uh, decline in consumption, the, the contraction in consumption, but it was actually 50% above uh, normal levels. Uh, then we had the commodity prices uh, going up uh, 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 with the, the um, crisis in the Ukraine and the exchange rate uh, increasing uh, up until uh, uh, a few days ago before uh, the central bank intervention. So we have four forces converging uh, or adding up to a strong pressure on inflation that has, uh, put, uh, has moved inflation uh, uh, to a point that we had not seen in nearly 25 years. Uh, but uh, monetary policy started reacting to that, not uh, last week, not in the last month, not in the th last uh, three months, but actually started reacting to inflationary pressures already in July last year. So we have had a whole year of, uh, of a monetary policy uh, adjustment um, that, uh, as uh, we saw in the presentation by the governor of the central bank, has uh, brought uh, the nominal uh, monetary policy rate to, uh, to an all-time high, at least in the times of, uh, of uh, a, a, a price uh, a, a, or a targeting, and the real rate uh, not uh, so high because it's uh, catching up with inflation, but also pretty high as well. And uh, uh, that has uh, contributed to slow down and then uh, to uh, cool off uh, economic activity uh, in a way that is uh, uh, pretty uh, 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 evident in, with the data. Um, uh, we see that uh, GDP uh, slowed down since uh, the, the end of uh, 2021. In the first uh, quarter of 2022, we already had uh, a, a negative uh, growth compared to the prior quarter, uh, uh, um, seasonally adjusted. And when we see the different components of uh, GDP on a more uh, on a higher frequency data, we see how, for instance, uh, commerce uh, started uh, uh, retreating uh, since uh, uh, already since August 2021, and uh, how that <coughs> uh, downward adjustment has uh, speeded up uh, in the last uh, few months. Uh, that is reflected, for instance, in this uh, 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 data on retail and supermarket uh, sales. Uh, but uh, that is not the end of the story, because uh, if uh, we uh, look ahead, we can see that, uh, um, that liquidity uh, with uh, households has been uh, uh, going down. Actually, in the case of, uh, of uh, a bank uh, deposit, current account deposits, is uh, now below, uh, pre, uh, uh, below the level that they had uh, prior uh, to uh, pension fund withdrawals, all that uh, huge uh, jump was, of course, due to pension fund withdrawals. Uh, it is natural that uh, it is, uh, you could expect that uh, current account deposits uh, should 
uh, go below, move uh, below uh, prior levels uh, if at the same time the interest rate is going up. And then, of course, it is more attractive to keep uh, uh, <coughs> to invest in uh, in um, in term uh, deposits or uh, savings accounts. Um, and uh, in the case of site accounts, uh, they have been going down a, a pretty uh, in, a, in a pretty markedly way as well. Uh, uh, similarly, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know thinking ahead of what you could expect from consumption, uh, consumption should be also uh, pushed down by a, a, a contraction in uh, the um, in the wage bill. Uh, here in the middle uh, chart, we uh, include uh, our estimate of uh, uh, of uh, the wage bill uh, in the second quarter of the year that is below. Uh, the first uh, quarter, and uh, to that we can add um, a, a business uh, a perceptions, consumer uh, perceptions, all that uh, uh, moving into negative uh, territory uh, for a, a number of months. So uh, what we can expect is, uh, uh, in addition to the contraction of uh, consumption that we have already witnessed, uh, further contraction should follow in the next, uh, in the next uh, couple of quarters uh, at le in the list. Uh, this uh, is uh, uh, combined with uh, a contraction in investment, uh, both uh, for construction and for a, a, a investment in machinery and equipment. Uh, public investment uh, is expanding, but of course that is uh, relatively small compared to uh, private sector investment. So it will it can only cash on this uh, contraction in in uh, in, uh, in private sector investment. Uh, and uh, uh, as for the government, uh, government is undergoing major fiscal consolidation with a contraction of uh, a public spending by 24 percent, very much in line with uh, what was uh, included in, the, in this uh, year's budget. And with that, uh, we will move uh, from um, a fiscal balance uh, of uh, uh, nearly 7 percent uh, 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 or more than 7% uh, last year into nearly zero uh, in 2022, uh, comparing with the uh, 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 current account uh, uh, deficit in the balance of payment uh, that uh, may remain pretty close to 7%. Uh, right now it is larger than that, but we, we should expect that to adjust in the second half of the year because of uh, uh, adjusting uh, spending, particularly spending on imported uh, in imported uh, uh, items. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, change in the in the fiscal stance is uh, considerably deeper than what you see in other countries. Um, if uh, you look at uh, at uh, uh, some averages for uh, groups of countries uh, fro coming from the IMF uh, fiscal uh, estimates. You see that in the euro area, they were expecting a deficit of 4.3% uh, for 2022, 7.6% um, uh, for emerging uh, Asia, including uh, China. Uh, it's 5% in Europe, 5% in Latin America and the Caribbean. So uh, this uh, scale of uh, fiscal consolidation is pretty large. It is the mirror, mirror image of the excessive expansion of 2021. Uh, but, it's, uh, but even so, uh, even though it may uh, look easier uh, than uh, otherwise, uh, of course, it, uh, you, uh, some of you may remember that uh, uh, last year when the budget was discussed, many people thought it was, that it was uh, impossible to uh, perform this uh, kind of uh, uh, adjustment. So um, with that, uh, we could uh, think of the economy moving uh, pretty much in the way that is depicted in the, in the chart. Uh, but, uh, you know, when uh, we discuss uh, uh, annual uh, GDP changes, when, uh, when GDP is changing so much within a year, it is important to see, you know, how uh, 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 economic activity is uh, evolving quarter by quarter. Uh, so why we are uh, 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 estimating a growth of 1.6% of GDP in 2022, if the economy is cooling off, it is because it's cooling off from a very high point, from a, a, an overheating position. Uh, that we, it may, is likely to continue throughout this year, so that means that in terms of uh, the 
technical definition of a recession that will happen this year. I don't think there is any question about that. But the point is uh, how long that uh, will be. If we do our job uh, well, uh, we uh, may uh, start recovering uh, in uh, at the beginning of uh, 2023. And uh, if that uh, recovery proceeds at a normal pace, uh, economic activity for the year will still look slightly below the 2022 level, but actually it will be moving up. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, um, stock markets, uh, uh, well, we saw that uh, in, the, in the early presentation. Um, they have not, uh, I, I, they have performed better than in other countries in the last few months. Uh, similarly with uh, uh, long-term interest rates, except from, uh, from the last few days. And that uh, suggests that um, the depreciation of the Chilean currency is not the result of, a, an, a, of a capital outflows or capital flight, but rather a market movements that became a, a pretty intensive in the last few days and that uh, led the central bank to intervene in the exchange market. There you see the evolution of the exchange rate and the volatility of the exchange rate uh, with a, a very strong volatility uh, last week uh, prior to the central bank intervention. Uh, well, the governor already uh, summarized, uh, gave, uh, shared the main uh, features of that intervention. And with that, uh, what we have seen be uh, from uh, between Friday and today is that uh, the exchange rate has uh, gone down by more than, uh, than 100 pesos in two days. Uh, uh, inflation expectations have adjusted as well. Uh, the spread uh, over uh, over the, uh, <coughs> the uh, U.S. Uh, LIBOR is also down, and the 10-year bond yield is uh, back to where it was at the beginning of last week. So a number of adjustments uh, uh, following uh, what uh, I think that uh, many people are, are, are already um, uh, 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 describing as a, a successful intervention. Of course, uh, this is not resolved in a couple of days, but uh, at least it's a good start. Uh, but uh, in any case, an important issue to bear in mind is that uh, currency depreciation in Chile has uh, perhaps a different meaning than uh, what you may see in other countries because uh, 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 Chilean uh, economic agents are considerably better hedged against uh, the exchange rate. Uh, both um, uh, government and households, our households do not uh, hold uh, liabilities in U.S. dollars. They don't borrow in dollars. They borrow in, in pesos. And the government is, uh, uh, has a surplus in, in foreign currency, surplus in, in, uh, in dollars. Uh, so it's not uh, hit by currency depreciation either. And uh, when you move uh, to the corporate sector and banks, banks are, are pretty well hedged. Uh, they learned uh, many lessons uh, from the crisis of the 1980s. And of course, regulations also point uh, in that direction. And uh, corporates uh, uh, have uh, very limited uh, uh, currency mismatches, either because of a natural hedging uh, uh, on their assets, or uh, because they uh, or because they uh, uh, they, they hedge uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, um, FX uh, uh, FX uh, uh, coverage or insurance uh, in in the derivatives uh, market. Uh, so, uh, of course, there is uh, 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 high inflation, brings many costs, it is risky, it's not welcome at all, uh, but at least the connection between uh, uh, the exchange rate and financial stability is, uh, I, I think, is very well uh, uh, covered and secured by these uh, more structural features of the Chilean economy. Uh, now let me move to a, a separate issue, which is uh, tax reform. Um, I will describe uh, what is uh, being uh, proposed uh, to uh, Congress uh, very briefly, but uh, uh, I think it, it is important to start by acknowledging that despite a few uh, reforms over the year, uh, since uh, 1990 or right after the 1990 tax reform, uh, tax burden has not uh, changed significantly uh, in uh, about uh, 30 years. Uh, the um, the uh, 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 tax hikes in certain components of taxation uh, basically counterbalance the decline in, the, uh, in tax uh, collection for, from 
uh, from import uh, duties. Uh, so that explains why, even though we had a number of reforms, a uh, tax burden didn't change much. And that kept uh, Chile uh, well below uh, the tax burden of OECD countries. Uh, if uh, you include uh, social security contributions, uh, Chile uh, stands at 27% of GDP, uh, 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 nearly 8 percent, uh, percentage points of GDP below the OECD average. Of course, that doesn't mean that we need to uh, mimic what happens at the OECD, but uh, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that uh, over 30 years, uh, the demand for uh, a, 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 a enhanced uh, social rights by uh, the population have increased, uh, and with the same tax burden, is, uh, a, a is increasingly difficult to respond to that uh, kind of, uh, of uh, demands. Um, and uh, given that, uh, that uh, the shape or the structure of, uh, of uh, tax collection is also different, uh, particularly that uh, um, uh, income uh, personal income tax is uh, pretty low compared to uh, these uh, more advanced economies, uh, uh, less than, an, uh, than a quarter uh, of uh, what is uh, collected in OECD uh, countries, uh, then uh, you can see that there is uh, room uh, for a, pay, a tax reform that does not only generate additional revenue for government, but also contributes to improve uh, the sense of fairness in, uh, the, in the structure of, uh, of the tax system by increasing progressivity, particularly at the level of the personal income tax, and also to reduce uh, tax loopholes and opportunities for aggressive uh, tax planning that is uh, resented by many people as uh, unfair, uh, uh, given that, uh, that uh, firms and individuals that have the resources to hire a, a legal advice and, uh, and, uh, and uh, accountants and so on are able to take advantage of uh, some of the loopholes that, is, uh, that, uh, that the system has. Uh, tax reform is also addressing uh, uh, increasing, uh, at increasing the legitimacy of uh, tax uh, collection to modernize uh, the tax system and to increase efficiency uh, in our tax uh, code by simplifying and reducing compliance costs that in Chile are above the OECD average as well, uh, even uh, though we have, as we saw, a lower uh, tax uh, revenue. So with that, uh, uh, we have a proposed tax reform that includes uh, a number of uh, changes to individual taxation, particular reform on personal income taxation, uh, the introduction of a wealth uh, tax, uh, the reduction of tax exemptions, uh, uh, anti-avoidance uh, measures, uh, a, a royalty on mining, and uh, corrective uh, taxes. Of these, only the last uh, component is, uh, will be submitted later in the year, but uh, both uh, the um, uh, uh, reform of uh, uh, income tax uh, was already submitted uh, to Congress, as well as uh, 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 proposals uh, to uh, changes to the uh, mining royalty that is being discussed in Congress for, uh, for a couple of years. Uh, this, uh, the, the proceeds from uh, these uh, reforms will go into funding the expansion of social rights uh, to promote uh, research and development, innovation, support for small and medium enterprises, and funding for regional uh, development and, uh, and, the, um, and the environmental protection. Uh, on the spending side, we uh, intend to introduce further transparency and budget efficiency measures uh, to regulate um, uh, regional finances and uh, to enhance uh, fiscal sustainability. Uh, of these uh, reforms, perhaps I would call your, uh, I will draw your attention to the uh, changes uh, to income tax because here we are moving from this uh, semi-integrated system into a dual uh, uh, income tax uh, system whereby you have a different uh, track for uh, labor earnings as compared to capital or earnings from uh, capital uh, so that uh, instead of uh, having um, a personal income tax uh, 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 with this uh, progressive scale being applied to distributed profits. Instead of that, we are proposing to apply a flat uh, tax rate of 22% uh, to distributed uh, profits uh, to individuals, and the same rate would apply to capital uh, gains. 
Um, so with that, you would have these uh, two tracks. Not everything is uh, perfect because, uh, for instance, uh, uh, earnings from uh, interest or leasing uh, will remain with the, with the uh, personal uh, income tax. But uh, anyway, what uh, I think it's, uh, it, it is salient is that uh, we, we are trying to put, uh, uh, to evolve from this uh, uh, constant te tension that we have endured over many years uh, uh, between uh, uh, integration or disintegration of uh, the uh, corporate tax with the personal income tax. Hmm. Um, uh, now the details of that are in this, uh, in this uh, slide. So uh, the corporate in in income tax is reduced, or it's proposed to be reduced from 27 to 25%. Uh, we are introducing a 2% development rate that can be entirely deducted uh, if uh, uh, applied to fund uh, um, investments in, uh, uh, in uh, productivity. Uh, then distributed dividends uh, will be taxed at this flat 22% uh, uh, rate. Uh, labor income uh, will be subject to a table of marginal rates going from zero to 43 percent, where uh, changes are done uh, are concentrated on the upper half of the of the uh, income tax uh, table, and then the deferral of uh, personal taxes will be subject to a 1 percent uh, 1.8 percent tax on companies uh, receiving more than 50 percent of their income from uh, passive uh, sources. A wealth tax will uh, apply uh, for uh, net assets uh, above uh, uh, five million dollars at a uh, at a one percent rate, and then 1.8 percent for net assets uh, above uh, 15 million dollars. And the royalty on mining um, that is uh, being proposed by government lies uh, somewhere in between the two proposals that were discussed in Congress, uh, a purely uh, ad valorem uh, 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 royalty proposed by the Chamber of Deputies and a, a combined or a mixed um, a, a royalty combining uh, ad valorem and, uh, a, and a, a tax uh, or a, a royalty on operative uh, margins uh, uh, from uh, the Senate. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, revenue will fall somewhere in between and uh, at least our estimates of return over equity in the uh, mining industry should uh, uh, guarantee um, a average uh, uh, return on uh, capital or on investments that uh, is uh, enough to uh, continue uh, 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 generating incentives to, to invest in this uh, sector. The balance of uh, tax reform is uh, for um, uh, tax revenue to increase by a little more than 4% by 2026, um, starting substantially in 2024. So there will be a, a, a year and a half, two year gap uh, between now the discussion of reforms and the time where substantial uh, increase in tax collation will happen. Uh, and the, of that increase in tax uh, revenue, uh, about uh, two thirds uh, will, be, uh, will come from uh, the taxation on individuals, particularly on the, um, on the personal income tax and the wealth uh, tax. Uh, with that, um, uh, our tax burden uh, will move uh, from 27% uh, of uh, GDP to some 32% of or 31.7% of GDP, still below the OECD average. And in comparing with uh, um, a, a personal income taxes and property taxes, we see that after the tax reform, we will still lie uh, below, uh, substantially below the OECD average for personal income taxes, and uh, uh, also below the OECD uh, with, uh, for property taxes. Uh, the main reason why, uh, in the case of personal income taxes, the gap will remain uh, uh, pretty large is because the basis uh, for uh, personal income tax is much broader in OECD countries than it is in Chile, where only 25% of the population pay income tax. Uh, with, uh, that, with that uh, uh, revenue estimates, um, tax reform uh, should provide about half the funding for the government uh, program over the four-year uh, uh, horizon. The other half will come uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, um, the gap 
between committed expenditures and expenditure that is consistent with the structural uh, uh, target and, with, and uh, uh, adding up some productivity gains that we intend to obtain over this time. So it is a sort of balance, uh, a, a, a balanced funding for the government program, but where the timing and the relative weight of each sources uh, uh, changes over time. Um, uh, to us, it is also very important to recover Chilean capital markets, uh, as we uh, saw earlier. Uh, capital markets lost uh, uh, some 20% uh, of GDP as a result of uh, pension fund withdrawals. We have a number of uh, measures and reforms uh, under discussion or close uh, to be uh, proposed uh, to Congress uh, in that uh, uh, table on the, on the left, uh, fi the Financial Innovation Bill and the Consolidated Debt Registry are the ones that are more advanced in their discussion in Congress, but there are a number of other initiatives that are underway, uh, but still the challenge is, uh, is uh, major given the evolution of uh, the assets of the pension system that is, uh, of course, uh, adds up to uh, the larger component of institutional investment and, the, and the assets in the capital market uh, in Chile. Um, now, uh, therefore, it is uh, uh, the, uh, to uh, recover from there, uh, there is a substantial effort that we need to do. So one question that we may uh, raise is to what extent pension reform uh, will contribute to that. Uh, pension reform is, uh, is, uh, is uh, to be submitted or to propose uh, late in August. But uh, at this point, uh, we, there are a few issues that we can point out or that we can uh, 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 underscore. Uh, first of all, I mean, if we look at the different components of what should be our future pension system, that is a multi-pillar system. Um, uh, first of all, uh, a universal guaranteed base uh, should be able to uh, be uh, uh, appropriately funded uh, from uh, taxation or from permanent uh, revenues from the government so that uh, that does not uh, erode the savings base of the economy. So that's one issue. Secondly, we will have a savings uh, pillar uh, funded from uh, contributions from workers that should be entirely capitalized and managed on, a pri on an individual capitalization basis. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, there is a proposal, the proposal uh, from uh, uh, the government's uh, program is to create a, a, a what we could call a social insurance uh, pillar funded from the 6% contribution from employers. But that uh, additional contribution, even if we label it as a as social insurance, need to be sustainable over time. So in order to be sustainable, uh, we, need, we will need to build up reserves that are sufficient to cover uh, and to counterbalance the effect of uh, a demographic trans transition over the years. So at least a half of this 6% contribution should be capitalized as well to ensure sustainability of the pension system uh, moving forward. And finally, uh, there will uh, remain a voluntary pillar that will also be managed uh, on, the, on the basis of, of capitalization. So, independently of who are the actors, how much competition there is, how much mobility there is, what, is, what should be pretty clear at this point is that there is no way that we will have a reform that is, does not capitalize because uh, we, have we are sufficiently advanced in demographic transition uh, uh, to uh, be, uh, not to rely on anything other than capitalization to secure uh, longer term fin uh, uh, funding. So if we put the numbers to this, uh, then uh, we could see that if uh, only uh, uh, half of the additional contribution of 6% uh, is uh, capitalized and it's built up as uh, uh, reserves, that uh, would, uh, should be able to turn around the, uh, the evolution of uh, uh, domestic assets of pension system systems. Um, uh, that we have endured over the last uh, two years. It would still take uh, some uh, 14 years to regain uh, the level of, uh, of uh, uh, long-term private savings from uh, the pension systems that we had before uh, pension fund withdrawals. But uh, we can accelerate that 
if we, at the same time, in addition to capitalizing part of this additional contribution, uh, we reduce um, uh, um, or we increase uh, a, a pension uh, I mean, contribution density, that is, I mean, uh, today, uh, Chileans, on average, contribute to their pension funds only half their life. The other half uh, uh, is uh, either uh, a, a periods of unemployment, of uh, people withdrawing the labor force, or joining later, or retiring earlier, or under declaring their earnings. But uh, uh, so if we uh, are able uh, to increase dens uh, uh, contribution density, we could further build up uh, a, a savings in the pension system. That is not unfeasible, but uh, we need to think of how to stimulate um, contributions by uh, uh, self the self-employed, by independent workers, and, and there are a number of ways to do that. But uh, you have to think, it, but in order to, to move in that way, you have to think out of the box. We have to, you have to think out of a world of uh, dependent workers on full time uh, with uh, full time jobs in factories or something like that. You have to think of people that uh, uh, may have uh, may need uh, a straightforward, simple way of contributing uh, to their pensions in the future. And uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you uh, can be sure that there will be a number of uh, 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 of uh, provisions in that direction in the uh, in the in pension reform. And uh, secondly, if we reduce under declaration and we raise the wage uh, limit uh, to contribute to pensions, we can further uh, increase uh, pension fund accumulation and deepening of the uh, local capitals market. So with that, uh, uh, combining with the uh, reserve buildup uh, 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 on the basis of the 6% contribution, we can, we can cut uh, short this uh, uh, time required to rebuild, uh, um, rebuild the local capitals market from 14 years to seven years. We can cut uh, that by half. Uh, so it is pretty much worth moving uh, in that uh, direction and that will be included in the pension reform. Now, uh, I have already mentioned uh, fiscal policy, but again, I mean, uh, being a minister of finance, I cannot, uh, 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 I cannot uh, underscore uh, less the fact that uh, we, are, we are having such a substantial uh, fiscal consolidation this year and that uh, government uh, not only plans but actually commitments uh, on the basis of, uh, of the fiscal responsibility law is uh, to continue in that direction uh, with uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, targets year by year until uh, 2026 when we expect uh, uh, public uh, debt uh, to reach uh, some 43% uh, 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 of GDP, uh, so well below, I mean, uh, below the 45% ceiling that we uh, set as a, as a policy uh, commitment. Uh, in this year, this, is, uh, this uh, fiscal consolidation is happening on the basis of a substantial reduction in government transfers. Uh, public investment will still go up, um, uh, uh, so there is not only uh, fiscal consolidation, but also rebalancing of uh, expenditure within the, the budget. And finally, on the constitutional process, uh, as uh, uh, you are surely aware, on uh, July the 4th, the Constitutional Convention delivered the proposal for a new constitution uh, to the executive branch, uh, so as to, to put that uh, to uh, the referendum vote uh, by September the 4th. Uh, the uh, proposed contribution, uh, the uh, constitution has, uh, I think it's uh, uh, 360 or so uh, articles. It is uh, considerably longer than the current constitution. But in order to make a fair comparison, I would invite, uh, you know, if there are lawyers here, uh, to, uh, com uh, to uh, compare not only with the main body of the current constitution, but also with a substantial part of the constitutional laws that uh, evolved from there, because as you know, the Chilean constitution uh, 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 currently uh, considers these uh, constitutional laws with a, a, a higher voting requirement that is part of the constitutional infrastructure. Yeah? 
Uh, so for those that think that uh, you know, uh, three, 360 articles may be too long, uh, I should uh, mention that uh, you should compare, for instance, in the case of the central bank, uh, currently you have, uh, you have only two articles in the constitution, uh, but then you have all the relevant uh, 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 statements or legal definitions including, included in the constitutional law. So the purpose of the central bank, the way the council is appointed and so on, all that is in the, in the, uh, in the uh, central bank uh, uh, law. Uh, and uh, in the uh, proposal for the new constitution, uh, those uh, two articles turn into six, but those six include four that are basic, basically taken from the constitutional law into the main body of the constitution with uh, very little changes. So in, on September the 4th, we will have this referendum that will have the particular feature of having a mandatory participation that is pretty different from all the elections that we have had in the last uh, uh, five years, I think. And in the plebiscite, uh, the question will be very simple, approve or reject the proposed new constitution. If uh, approved, uh, the president will ratify the new constitution, but then a, a new uh, a time of uh, legislation will follow because you will need the, we will need to uh, draft all the enabling legislation coming from the constitution if it is uh, uh, if the reject wins the uh, wins the, uh, the referendum uh, immediately the current constitution remains but uh, uh, as a, a given that uh, many people and the large majority of uh, people actually are aiming to a new constitution uh, the, the president has uh, uh, said that uh, probably a constitutional process uh, should restart uh, from pretty much from the beginning. Now, there are a number of uh, economic issues in the proposed new constitution. I cannot go into the details because it's uh, too late already. Uh, but uh, what uh, I would say is that uh, it is not in, uh, in constitutional provisions or in economic provisions where you will find the largest differences between the current constitution and the proposed one. Those differences have more to do with the degree of centralization of the country, with the political, the structure of the political system, uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, inclusiveness and, uh, of indigenous peoples, uh, equal rights for uh, men and women. Uh, you will find uh, the uh, introduction of many provisions related to the environment. Those are the larger uh, uh, those, that is where the largest uh, changes in the Constitution uh, lie. Uh, in the case of uh, economic uh, uh, provisions, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the sort of more ideological component of the current Constitution is uh, eliminated, but the, uh, the, um, the uh, political uh, regime is uh, defined as uh, as a, 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 a democratic, inclusive, multicultural, and so on a country. But uh, uh, for instance, uh, it is interesting to note that uh, the draft new constitution includes a number of, uh, of uh, provisions to secure good governance and good uh, uh, and financial res uh, and fiscal responsibility that were not part of the, of the current constitution. Um, so uh, I think that uh, it, uh, it is uh, useful to, to separate out what may be uh, uh, the economic uh, effects of changes, uh, let's say, to the political system or to citizens' rights. Uh, uh, take that uh, as separate from uh, direct uh, economic provisions in the Constitution that look uh, much more alike uh, uh, compared to the current uh, uh, Constitution. Uh, so summing up, uh, uh, I would say that uh, Chile is addressing the aftershocks of the COVID-19 crisis and long-term ch challenges in a decisive way uh, compared uh, in terms of um, the uh, 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 short-term macroeconomic uh, challenges. Uh, Chile is much more, has made much more progress uh, in applying, in cooling off its uh, economy uh, compared to other countries, uh, as I said, monetary policy started a year ago. Fiscal consolidation is uh, underway and it's uh, pretty substantial. Uh, so macroeconomic policy is doing its job and its impact on spending and demand is uh, already evident. Um, the financial sector remains solid 
uh, while economic agents are exposed to limited uh, to non-FX uh, risk. Uh, the government is laying down plans uh, to further strengthen the financial sector and to deepen capital markets. Productivity and green growth uh, agendas are developing fast. Fiscal uh, consolidation is moving ahead faster than expected. And then somebody uh, underlined the uh, you know, phrase here. Uh, and uh, tax reform uh, is aiming at providing the resources to address long-term social needs that emerged from the social crisis of 2019. Uh, and we are pre a, a pre a prepared to engage pragmatically with uh, Congress in discussing uh, this uh, uh, tax reform. Uh, political and social transition is keeping to its in institutionalized track. Uh, decisions that were made in the middle of uh, turmoil uh, in November 2019, at the time when also uh, local markets were melting, are moving ahead more than two years later and are about to reach to reach a very important landmark with the plebiscite or the referendum in September. And many challenges are ahead, uh, but the common purpose, dialogue, and trust will be essential to face them, and uh, the government uh, that uh, I belong will very, very much uh, to, uh, is very much prepared to work on those uh, lines. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Board of INPEST, I would like to thank you all for attending this very thorough presentations by the Minister of Finance of Chile and also Rosana Costa, the Governor of Central Bank that has just left because she has to travel to Chile back. And now I'm very pleased to invite you all to the cocktail reception that is in the same floor in rooms Kennedy 1 and 2. Thank you. <laughs>